Okay, welcome to everyone for joining us today. Um, before I begin, I want to let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can mute yourself or turn off your camera, although we love to see everyone's faces if, you're, if you feel comfortable. Uh, I'd like to start out with uh, the land acknowledgement, our territorial acknowledgement for being here in, in the city of Calgary. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Bigane, Gaina, First Nations, the Tsutina First Nation, and the Stodi Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Beresspaw, and Wellesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So we are all very grateful to be here. I, it is with great pleasure that I welcome my longtime friend, Dr. Tao Jiang, to speak to us at the as part of the Numata Yehan Numata lecture series here. Um, this I have been engaging with fascinating in fascinating conversations with Professor Jiang about comparative philosophical topics for many years, and I'm very excited about his new book, Origins of Moral Political Philosophy in Early China. Um, early, I frequently use his previous um, book on a very different but somehow related um, set of problems, uh, Context and Dialogue, Yogacara Buddhism and Modern Psychology on the Subliminal Mind. Uh, he is, in addition to other important publications, he has also done an amazing amount of, of work as at Rutgers University, serving as chair of the religion department, highly appreciated uh, chair, which as we all know is a really difficult feat to pull off, um, and also director of um, the Center for Chinese Studies at Rutgers. He also co-chairs the Neo-Confucian Studies Seminar and um, serves as the Buddha, on the Buddhist Philosophy Unit at the American Academy of Religion and founded the India and China um, Compared Unit that I currently uh, participate in. So I I, without further ado, I would like to welcome this remarkably um, erudite and prolific uh, scholar to talk to us today about Zhuangzi and the tragedy of personal freedom in Chinese history. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so this is the this is the first uh, book talk that I have. So it uh, it really um, it, it's a really special occasion. So as Wendy mentioned that this, uh, this talk, uh, Drums and the Tragedy of Personal Freedom in Chinese History. Um, so it's based upon um, the materials from my book, Origins of Moral Political Philosophy in Early China, uh, Contestation, uh, Contestation of Humanist Justice and uh, Personal Freedom. So personal freedom is obviously an important component of it. Um, so and it turns out that the uh, Zhuangzi and his particular understanding of personal freedom um, is actually one of the motivating um, sort of forces for this book. I'm, I've been working on it for almost a, almost a decade and a half. Um, so it's, it's in some ways very uh, long time making. Um, initially, I was going to just uh, write a small book just on Zhuangzi. I mean, there are plenty of materials to write on, on Zhuangzi. This is a, a huge text itself. But then uh, in the course of doing research and formulating his understanding of uh, personal freedom, then I, that I felt I had to take into account the, uh, the project that he was critiquing, right? The, what's, what he calls the Ru Mo, the Confucian and the uh, Moist project, which constituted the, the mainstream moral political project during the Warren States period the, in early China. Uh, but then I quickly find out um, that I 
don't really know enough about the, 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 the kind of the normative dimension of the mainstream political project yet. I mean, I mean, see, I, I understand some of these uh, basic concepts and disputations and the basic narrative, but then I uh, lack a kind of a, a normative understanding of the uh, of those uh, sort of moral political project. So then I dived in uh, 15 years later, I have this book. So so that's uh, this is a, a, a sort of a very a short history of you know of how this book really came about and for those of you who uh who know Zhuangzi, who at least heard about him and you know this is an extraordinary work i mean there's just almost no other work in chinese history uh, quite like it um and he had a lot of impact on chinese spiritual and literary tradition and relevant to today's uh sort of sponsor then it's, it clearly has a lot of impact on Taoism, on, on Chan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, um, and in Chinese literature, in arts. But unfortunately, it was pretty much an outlier in Chinese moral political uh, discourse. Uh, so why is that the case? So I wanted to delve into that question here. So I'm only going to talk about the uh, the philosophical aspect of his uh, of his teaching, and I would not get into really fascinating questions about authorship, about the, the, the textual issues, you know, the stratifications and the transmission that the, those are the really, really important issues that I addressed with some lens in the book itself. So here's the outline of the presentation. I'm gonna first sketch out uh, what I understand to be the drawingest metaphysics. I mean, it's not really Zhuangist in the in the narrow sense of the term. It's basically the kind of uh, understanding of the nature of the world that's broadly shared by uh, by Chinese by you know Chinese philosophers. Um, the the but the Zhuangzi in some ways was very very uh, sort of those two aspects relationality and change. Those two aspects were very prominently featured uh, in Zhuangzi's text. So. Because the his um, project of personal freedom was very much framed within such an understanding of the world, and so here, personal freedom I sort of define it in a very brief sort of fashion as the appreciation and cultivation of personal space, wherein one can be left alone and enjoy the company of like-minded friends without being entangled and. Uh, in, in, without being entangled in the social political world in the midst of constant and often unpredictable changes. And that's a sort of a working definition of the, uh, of the of personal freedom that I will be talking about. So, so that's the, the sort of the metaphysical context of the drone of drones project. And then I'll um, move into what I consider to be the two spaces of personal freedom in the drones that I'll elaborate what that means. And then at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the tragedy of the drawingist approach to personal freedom. Um, before I start, um, I wanted to um, br briefly bring to, to your attention this particular passage, a very famous uh, passage in the, uh, in the Li Yun chapter of the, uh, of the classical Confucian uh, canonical text, uh, the Li Ji. Here we find um, Li Ji depicting an ideal or idealized world through the mouth of Confucius, who was sort of reminiscent, he was portrayed as reminiscent a, you know, a world, a lost golden age world when, when the great Tao prevailed. So this is a rough translation. When the great Tao prevailed, the world was just, people were selected for their virtues and talents, so they were trustworthy, good neighborly, everybody was properly taken care of, especially those uh, who are who needs uh, be taken care of and and so it's 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 a very sort of ideal uh, idealized uh, harmonious you know prosperous you know very virtuous kind of society right you know so that's uh, but what's interesting not if in this passage we can very much find the sort of the what we consider to be the confucian elements the moist elements um even though it's enshrined within the confucian tradition as you know a one of the uh, can canonical texts but then we find the Confucian elements, the Moist elements, and some others. But what's also conspicuous is the sort of the absence of the Zhuangist vision of personal freedom, that we don't really see that in this grand utopian picture of the grand unity. So, so I'm, I sort of, I wanted to set this talk within that as the background. Now, move on to the, uh, to the Zhuangist uh, metaphysics. So the first is the, relationality. <clears throat> now, 
relationality, basically, it's portraying the world, the nature of the world, you know, the human world, as well as the natural and the uh, and the animal world, and we're the uh, that all forms of existence is, you know, intrinsically relational. So relationship is constitutive of our existence, and especially in the human and the animal world. Um, now, Zhuangzi has a very deep ambivalence about this intrinsic uh, relational nature of existence, right? Um, he sees a lot of uh, sort of perilousness in relationality. Uh, unlike most of his peers, um, he actually problematized the, you know, the aspect of entanglement in uh, relationality, whereas some others, like, for example, the Confucians, tends to see the more positive aspect of relationship, especially like family relationships. So it's and tends to emphasize the sort of the more nurturing aspect of relationship and see that um, a flor a good life is the one that, you know, of, with a good relationship. But Drones is unique in the sense that he, you know, he's, 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 a, he's quite ambivalent about it. Uh, so there's a very uh, famous story um, in the text about this one of the cases of the uh, perilousness of relationality. So this is the story uh, tells about Zhuangzi seeing a cicada was about to be preyed upon by a mantis who, which itself was oblivious to its own imminent danger of being attacked by a magpie who itself did not realize that it was the target of a bird catcher. Right, so the you know the the latter in each pair taking advantage of the former self deception and uh, illusory sense of safety. So this is the Tang Lang Bu Chan Huang Chue Zai Hou, this the famous Chinese uh, expression. Now Zhuangzi was absolutely traumatized by this uh, by this sight. You know he you know he said it's inherent in things they are tied to each other and, and one kill one uh, you know that one can cause up another. So this is the Er Lei. And he he was pretty much depressed for for several months. Um, what's interesting here, the Er Lei Xiang Zhao. Now, we find in the text, in the Zhuangzi text, lots of expressions, lots of Xiang expressions that capture this pervasive relationality um, in the world. So we have the mutual stabbing, you know, crushing, prevailing upon each other, kicking each other mutual suspicion, mutual deception, you name it. It's, you know, it's, it's bad, you know, sort of this. So the, the, the xiang expression, the xiang meaning mutual, uh, so each other, and that's a really perilous kind of, per, perilous kind of uh, relationality that's pervasive in the text. The only two exceptions, there are two exceptions to this um, largely uh, sort of negative um, expressions of mutuality. Uh, the first is Xiang uh, Xu and the other is Xiang Ru. One is um, the first, you know, Xiang Xu meaning the spitting moist at each other. The other is soaking each other in the foam. Um, now, this th these two expression appears in this very famous uh, Zhuangzi story about um, sort of the fish, right? When they were stranded on land, so they sort of spit moist on in on each other to soak each other in the foam in order to stay alive. So they rely on each other. But he said, you know, isn't it better for fish to just to forget each other and be left alone than enjoy the, you know, the, the river and the lake? Um, and he, of course, uh, make the analogy to say, well, the human, it's by, you know, by the same token, human beings, you know, if we're trying, busy and trying to help each other out, and would it be better off that if we simply forget each other and enjoy, you know, the Tao, right? So, so it turns out that the only, really the only Xiang expression in the text that the fully embraced in fully embraced in the Zhuangzi will be the Xiang Wang, right? Then forgetting each other, right? This is a really uh, sort of striking aspect of the um, of the Zhuangzi's metaphysical under, you know, understanding of the nature of the world. So that's first aspect. The second um, aspect of this Zhuangzi's metaphysics is the, the the element of transformation and change. Now um, the the text. Um, Zhuangzi opens, you know, with the first chapter, Xiao Yao Yao, Roaming with East, it opens up with, with this really dramatic depiction of, of this transformation of this huge fish, Kun, right, transformed into this humongous bird, Peng. Now, it's, it's you know, the, the scale of the, uh, of the imagery, it's meant to shock and awe, you know, um, and it's, you know, that, that's what it's supposed to, to do. Uh, so it's, so the change is, you know, the, the theme of change and transformation is really central 
to, uh, to the drawings to the text. And the text emphasized this sort of the inevitability and universality, uh, the universal nature of change. Another uh, famous expression of transformation and change is the expression of wuhua, right? The transformation of things or transmission of thing, one thing into another. And this, is, uh, this expression um, is used in this famous butterfly dream example. And that's, um, that's, very, that's probably one of those famous examples in the, in the Zhuangzi, where you know, one night Zhuangzi dreamed that he was a butterfly enjoying himself. And then when he woke up, he saw, oh, I was dreaming of, that I was a butterfly. But then he thought, well, maybe I, I'm actually a butterfly who's now dreaming that I'm Zhuangzi. So, so, that, you know, so he was musing about the, the kind of the, the transformation of things, so the wuhua. Um, so, so the, the transformation and change is, is really, really pervasive in the text that we find. But the most dramatic, uh, the most um, sort of uh, dangerous kind of change in the text is the change that's known as death, of course. And this is the most dangerous and incomprehensible uh, disruption in the human world and in the, in, the, in the natural world more generally. And therefore, because of uh, the, the gravity of this, um, of this death occasion, especially with the departing of a loved one. So then the funeral ritual is amongst the most sacred ritual occasions in one's life. And so then this is also why ritual is such an important organizing principle, organizing uh, structure for the Chinese uh, life world, for, you know, for the, 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 uh, the, the Chinese world is in many ways organized by these different kinds of ritual norms that the ritual is a form of practice, but it's also signify a particular kind of way of organizing the human world in, in, in ancient China. Um, and funeral is one of the most important ritual occasions of that. Now, Zhuangzi's attitude towards uh, death and therefore towards ritual is interesting. Now he's, you know, for the Confucians, the, you know, the, the ritual, especially in the case of death, then it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, through this very and detailed pres you know, prescription of these uh, different ritual performances, it's meant to manage how to deal with this such you know, kind of disruption in the human world, the, the kind of changes, how to manage that. But Johnson's attitude is that he was rather celebratory, you know, about the wonders of the cosmos. And he used the occasion to think about the sort of the, the wonders and the unpredictability of transformation. And he also tends to critique the narrowness and limitation of this normative um, Confucian approach to, to change and to death and using ritual as the way, to, as the sort of the kind of uh, coping, coping mechanism. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> So, as we know that uh, the, the Confucians um, appeals to ritual to, um, to nurture relationality and to manage change, right? So when we talked about these um, major uh, sort of themes in the drawings metaphysics, and it's, again, it's something that's shared, widely shared among uh, classical Chinese thinkers, so relationality and change, and the Confucians appeal to ritual as the way to nurture relationality and to manage change. But Zhuangzi takes a rather different approach uh, to relationality and change. So what Zhuangzi wants to do is to create a space uh, within this pervasive relationality and change to create a space where one can enjoy a high degree of autonomy and independence. So he just want to be left alone in that. Uh, and in, in, especially in the case of the pervasiveness of relationality, in the case of change, then he just embrace the change, right? Now, how he does, how does he do that? He does that um, in, in, you know, the, the, the one of the mo most important theoretical move that he, the text makes is that he had latched onto this, very critical notion of xin. I translate uh, that as heart mind. Um, I have a note in the introduction of the book um, that explain why do I use a single singular term heart mind to translate xin rather than the more commonly used heart dash mind or heart and mind or uh, and so forth. Uh, because the in in classical Chinese the, the the what we in English we associate with the function of heart and mind is really not separated. So that's why I treat that as a singular term. Um, the, so the heart-mind is a really in, important um, 
concept in classical Chinese philosophy. Now, the, the Confucians, of course, also see this uh, as important, uh, that it's, this, is, this is how you, in, how you uh, cultivate and you know, sort of nurture uh, education. This is the training of the heart and mind is, is really, really important. But for, from Zhuangzi's perspective, this Confucian heart and mind, heart mind um, is too entangled in the world. Uh, he calls such heart mind a completed heart mind. Now, completed here, chengxin, it, it completed here doesn't have a positive connotation within the drones within the drones context. The the the, the, the chengxin here means that it's um, a completed heart and mind. Means that it's it's the one that's already populated by moral categories, right? Those moral categories are the fabrics of moral knowledge for the Confucians to nurture the heart and mind's ability to apply moral categories in dealing with um, life world lies at the core of the moral cultivation. Whereas for Zhuangzi, dealing with the problem is not simply a matter of applying moral categories to a problematic situation, since it entails a heart and mind that's predetermined. So if you already you know, sort of apply that, you know, it's for Zhuangzi that imply a closed heart and mind. <clears throat> and that's implying uh, a, a heart and mind that's that a heart mind that's blind to the fluidity and the nuance of a situation. So he accused such a fixed heart and mind of committing tautology in that he already reaches the conclusion of what's right and wrong before actually examining the situation in their concrete circumstances. I mean, there is the famous expression of you know setting out to to Yue uh, today, but then uh, arriving yesterday. That's a sort of a meaning that it's you already reached the conclusion before you even set out uh, to examine what's really going on. I mean, that's the, the a, a famous uh, drawing expression of of his critique of this chengxin, right? This completed heart and mind. Furthermore, the, a, moral, a morally fixed heart and mind is also oblivious to the fact that moral arguments are really, if ever, effective, and that other kinds of dynamics, right, concerns that are play in a given situation, uh, which can be far more powerful than moral argument. This is something that I argue in the book that it's, you know, mentions, for example, was very uh, much uh, cognizant of. But then, of course, Stronsu has a very, uh, takes a different uh, position on, on that question. So what Zhuangzi does is rather to promote a particular mode of cultivating the heart mind, unlike the Confucians, right, you know, to populate the heart mind with, you know, with sort of moral categories. Rather, the Zhuangzi has a different kinds of way to cultivate the heart mind that it, so that it retains its authenticity and freedom, right? So the so this is really important authenticity and freedom, which can be easily lost in the pursuit of, of moral knowledge, according to Zhuangzi. And so his method is what he calls the uh, fasting of heart mind, the Xinjai. Now, what's what is Xinjai, right? <clears throat> Xinjai is to you know is is a way of of cultivation that you know in that's that's thematized in the Zhuangzi to let the Tao into the heart mind, and to clean to clear away what's already in there, namely all of these moral um, categories that has already occupied the heart mind in the course of socialization as we as we grow up, and which those moral category of course is the one that makes such a heart mind a closed or fixed one. So the uh, so the fasting of heart mind clears away those pre-populated moral categories, such that the they would no longer stand in the way of the Tao coming to dwell in this emptied or cleansed heart heart mind. So there's definitely a bit of a um, a sort of an almost a mystical elements within the uh, within the text, and that's I think that's that's very that's widely acknowledged as well. So now so so. Um, I just talked about the the strongest um, picture of the uh, of the world, namely the uh, relationality and change. So, and the the um, and then the the centrality, the importance of the heart mind in the mix of that kind of metaphysics. Now, now we move to his conception of personal freedom. And we'll see that how you know how important those you know the, the picture of the world and the heart mind would really be. Again, to recap, the uh, the personal freedom is really understood uh, here as the appreciation and a cultivation of personal space wherein one can be left alone and or enjoy the company of like-minded friends without being tangled in the social political world in the midst of constant and often unpredictable uh, changes. 
So there are several concepts that's involved. First is you. Yo is a, is a very common Chinese term. It usually means travel, right? It's, but in Zhuangzi, it takes on almost a very sort of technical uh, term meaning. So, I'm trans so this is sometimes translated as roaming or navigating of the heart mind, the Xin. So that's, you know, so the, the Yo, the roaming and navigation of the heart mind. And there are two kinds of Yo, two kinds of this roaming. One is the roaming within the Fang, and the other is uh, roaming at the margin or outside the fun. The fun here uh, is really understood as the uh, the ritually constituted and regulated life world. I mean, so those are the key terms that I will be uh, that I will be talking about when we're talking about two spaces of uh, personal freedom in the drones. So the first is the uh, the first space is the the you know, the uh, fun wai, the roaming freedom as roaming at the margin of the life world. Now, so there are two kinds of fang wai. One is normative, the other is physical. I'm, I'm sort of thematize this in a, in a sort of sharply, in a sharp, in a sharp way, but then they, you know, in the text, of course, it's much more sort of mixed. So they, you know, one can be both and one or, or one or the other. Uh, I'm just, and, you know, sort of formulate this for the purpose of clarity. Now we know that the uh, that ritual constitutes the parameters of the life of the life world, right? So then the the fun would be then that would then be outside of this ritually constituted um, life world. So one will be normative fun the other will be the uh, will be the uh, the physical fun So. Um, there was a there's a very famous story about uh, the uh, about the uh, 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 the fang the fang wai. Um, so there was uh, let, me see, let me see whether I can um, Confucius. He was uh, sort of asking in the text. He asked um, one of his disciples, Zi Gong, to inquire about a Mr. Shanghu who recently died, and he's so he, he so he sent Zi Gong to ask in you know, the the funeral arrangement. But he's but the uh, the uh, um, the, uh, the Zi Gong. Uh, but but then his friends were just making just laughed at ridicule Zi Gong, say you know sort of you, basically you don't know what you're doing. And Zigong was completely puzzled because this is so outside of his understanding. So he, he basically he asked Confucius, say, who are these people? What are they doing? They they, they seem to have, you know, they, they seem to be just so weird. Um, what you know how to, what to make of them? And, and Confucius was uh, basically um, trying to uh, explain to his uh, uh, puzzled disciple. He said, oh poor guy. So I really shouldn't have sent you there because these are the people. Who operates who life operates under outside the guideline or outside the fun the fun way, whereas me somebody like me who operates within the fun who operate within the fun way. So that's that's a very uh, sort of an important kind of uh, expression of the uh, of the kind of normative fun way, meaning that you know the, those are the people whose behavior are outside the norm of the rituals. And of course, the, uh, the, the funeral ritual here is given as an example. And the, uh, the physical feng wai, um, you know, there, there are plenty of expressions uh, of those in the text. So there would be roaming between the heaven and earth into infinite, beyond four seas, beyond uh, the dust and grime. Um, and then the paradigmatic representation of of the kind of the physical feng wai will be those who live um, at the margin of the life world, those uh, hermits, for example, right? Uh, who, those who live on the, the waters, on the lakes, on the rivers, you know, the Yangtze River, or those who live in the high mountains. So we see this in the Xiaoyou chapter and in the old, old fisherman chapter. Um, <clears throat> so those are those are the, the, the expressions of uh, you know of the the representations of the fang wai. Now, those the fang wai becomes a major challenge to the ritual order and norm, which was of course uh, represented by the Confucian approach. Um, for the Confucians, ritual shapes and acculturate a particular kinds of disposition 
and worldview and behavior in this making the kind of ritual um, agent as well as a ritualized life world. And drones resist this very ritualization of the life world, ridiculing this mind-numbing ritual norms and dismissing the ossification of genuine dispositions into dogmatic uh, moralization. That's what, uh, so drones has a very different take on the, on the ritual order and norm. And the drones vision of freedom in this, uh, in this Fang Wai uh, iteration represents uh, one of the most potent challenges to this normative ritual order and, uh, and life world that was constituted by such a world, while offering Chinese intellectuals a, a kind of a alluring alternative to this dominant political and inter intellect and intellectual imaginaire. Um, and, and, and as such, this vision is actually quite subversive to this normative order that's constituted by the ritual. Okay, so that's Fang Wai. Now, there's another space that's conceptualized and formulated within the Zhuang Si, that's known as the Fang Nei, right? Fang, again, represents this ritually constituted and regulated um, life world. So this is within the bounds of the life world where the ritual um, sort of rules. So that's here within the Fang Nei, so then this is the freedom as roaming within the life world. Uh, this is roaming within the confines of the ritualized life world. And there, there are lots of um, sort of cases like that. This is a, a much, much subtler expression of freedom within the text, but it's, um, it's no less compelling you know, when compared with the, the Fang Wai expression of the freedom. And the most, by far the most famous expression of the Fang Nei uh, freedom will be this famous um, Kuk Din story, the Pao Din Jie Niu, the, the Kuk Din, this, but, this famous butcher, uh, his uh, sort of untangling of an ox, right? So I'm, I'm sure most of you, or, or probably even every, everybody has heard about uh, this, this story uh, that enumerates the most, um, the, the, the most fantastic example of this very distinct Strongest yo or, na or navigation or roaming within the life world, that in, in its portrayal of the butcher's supremely attuned senses and daemonic guided actions when roaming between the constraints with, uh, of an ox. So that's this is the uh, the the pao the, 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 the pao din jie niu story. Um, so let me let me just briefly read this one description. So Cook Ding was cutting up an ox for Lord Wen Hui. At every touch of his hand, every heave of his shoulder, every move of his feet, every thrust of his knee, zip, zop, he slithered the, the knife along with the zing, and all was in perfect rhythm, as though he were performing the dance of the mulberry grove or keeping time to the Jin So music. And it's rather, you know, the Mulberry Grove and the, and the Jin So music, these are all sort of allusions to these grand state occasions when these big grand state ritual occasions. It's kind of intriguing that uh, Drones' portrayal of Cook Dean's, this performance is similar in kind to this kind of a performance that's very, in a very carefully prescribed state ritual, right? So it's, it's a, uh, it's a very curious kind of portray of the kind of Fang Nei uh, maneuver um, that, that the, the Pao Ding could navigate within the bounds of this very clearly prescribed ritual occasion. Now, Cook Ding, of course, um, so, so the, the Lord Wen Hui was really uh, shell-shocked. He was impressed, so he, uh, so he was asking the uh, the you know the Cook Ding, how do you do that? So Cook Ding was explaining to the Lord that what he was actually interested in is the Tao, which is more than the skill. So and he goes into these different stages of his practice of this you know of this butchering of an ox. He said at the very beginning he you know he really only saw the 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 whole ox and he couldn't really see the inner structure of the bones of the joints of the muscles. But then as he progressed then he could start to detect different patterns and, 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 and so forth. So then, which makes it much easier for him to, to, to run his 
uh, the, the knife, the butcher's knife, in order to untangle this ox. And what this passage is really, this, this particular passage is really, really interesting. So I quote, at that joint, there is an interval and the chopper's edge has no thickness. If you insert what has no thickness where there is an interval, then what more could you ask? Of course, there is ample room to move the edge about. So what he was talking about here is that he said, at some point after decades of practice, then the way that he, he perceived the ox is no longer the, the ox in its totality, but rather he could see the intricate details of these different patterns. And he could even discern certain spaces, certain intervals between the joints, between the muscles and the, and the bones and so forth. And then his skill of running the of running the knife is in the chopper is such that it's it's you know the, the the chopper as if has no thickness it's so thin and so smooth that as if he could run the the chopper with without any thickness so and th that's why he didn't have to hack his way through the uh, ox like he did early on so he was able to just uh, very carefully navigate um, the uh, the intricacy of the inner structure of the ox and then voila, you know, everything just, you know, crashes down and, and mission accomplished. So what's really fascinating here is, is this, his discernment of an interval in a joint, this is called Yo Jian, and his realization of the thicknessness of his chopper's edge, this is Wu Ho, right? Yo Jian, Wu Ho, these are, these are really fascinating this depiction of a kind of highly accomplished skillful state, but neither will be apparent uh, from an ordinary perspective. So he wasn't privy to those uh, perspectives either early on, right, at the early stage of his uh, butchery. But that particular kinds of extraordinary perception and ability is, is the one that's achieved through long years of practice, which will then enable him to navigate, you know, almost effortlessly smoothly without running without sort of cutting you know sort of a uh, uh, without hacking his way through that because hacking his way through the ox you might think okay that's what's the big deal well you know it the the, the knife gets hurt right so then he used to have to change his knife his chopper very frequently but then after he was able to discern the uh, these different patterns different intervals then he didn't have to uh, change his chopper you know forever right so so what's the takeaway of this? I mean, this story has been, you know, explained, you know, so many on, in, in so many different ways. Um, so what I'm seeing this is that the ox is a metaphor for the intricacy and complexity of this ritually constituted life world. And this also explains sort of the, uh, the, the lesson learned by Lord Wenhui on how to nurture life from the butcher's performance of explanation. So, so it's because it's, it could be struggling when, you know, um, Lord Wenhui heard uh, Butcher, the cook Dean's exp explanation. He thought, okay, now I learn how to nurture life. You might think, okay, one is butchering ox, the other is nurturing life. What do they have, what do they have in common? Well, what they have in common is that the ox here is used metaphorically as signifying, you know, symbolizes the, the very intricacy and, and complexity of the life world. And that it takes a very, very skillful person and years of practice and in discernment uh, to really discern these sort of intervals, these different, you know, places where one, one can actually navigate such a world and without violating the kind of norm, the structure that's in place. Okay, so that's the, the sort of the, the takeaway from the, uh, the, the Pao Din Jie Niu, from the Kuk Din story, in so far as the Fang, fang Nei free, you know, freedom is concerned. And there's an, um, and the Zhuangzi is also very much um, sort of dealing with the, uh, the uh, another dimension of the Fang Nei freedom, which is, you know, very, very, it's perilous dimensions. And the most um, famous expression of that is the, uh, the expression of roaming free inside a king's cage, right? This is Yu Qi Fan. So this is, you know, the one, um, the, again, Confucius was advising his, you know, his, uh, his disciples, you know, to how to 
what's the proper way to to navigate the uh, you know the uh, you know when you when you were trying to when when his disciple was trying to convince uh, trying to persuade the, a a tyrant and to change his ways you know so so then this is and without any protection this is really a perilous kind of um, sort of effort so the because of the power imbalance so there's um, so you what's required is a very very different kinds of skill set in order to accomplish the mission. And most people really would not be able to do that. And because there's so many, uh, there, there's so many bombs that you can set up, you know, in, in dealing with a very pot, you know, sort of the a very volatile kind of situation if you're dealing with a, a, a tyrant. Um, and also he he, you know, in, in many ways, he was um, sometimes he, you know, he goes into these different uh, different kinds of discussion of the uh, of the uh, of the Fane dimension. But then ultimately, he would often use the uh, the, the the kind of the the Fang Wai expression to really sub to to sort of uh, to get around the uh, the the perilousness of these Fane dimension. And so the uh, sometimes, so for example, he would you know. So at some part of the text, he said, "Well, our duty to our um, to our lords and to our parents, there these are inescapable dimensions of our obligations in living in the world." But some other parts of the text, he said, "Well, you know, uh, okay, forget all of that. It, the, you know, I'm you know this is this is this is not uh, I'm not really committed to that after all." So the, the, uh, the, the so this is clearly there is clearly tension within the text within the Zhuangzi. And uh, so the most famous expression of this kind of rejection of the duty to serve the state is in the one of the outer chapters. It's called the Autumn Floods, the Chiosui chapter, where he compares someone who served the state to an enshrined dead you know, turtles and asks the kings, you know, sort of he asked the, the king's emissaries who were trying to recruit him. He said, uh, well, I'd rather be alive and, uh, you know, uh, rather than just uh, be dead uh, while serving the state. So, so on those occasions, he used, he resorts to the Fang Wai as the way to escape from the Fang Nei obligation. And so that's that that's the 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 what what we're dealing with in the text. And it's very clear that when he was dealing with the Fang Wai one, he was much much more free, let's say. Um, and when he was dealing with the Fang Nei dimension, it's much much more cautious. And because there's so many uh, potential um, sort of traps that you can easily fall under. Um, so another dimension of the Fane freedom uh, is something that we talked about. This is the dimension of forgetting. This is a very prominent theme within the, uh, within the Zhuangzi text. Uh, so the call to forget years, forget um, and obligations, um, this is the, uh, the, you know, this is uh, something that Zhuangzi talks about a lot in the text as well. And we, you know, the another famous uh, expression of, of forgetfulness, meaning is the, uh, the in the expression zuo wang, the, the sitting in forgetfulness. That's a kind of a, in a kind of a practice uh, to in order to, uh, in, in order to, you know, one of those uh, drawings practice in order to cleanse the, you know, the, the, our, our heart mind. But the, uh, what's interesting in this case, in the forgetting in the social and political aspect of this, and this is something that, uh, that has uh, not really garnered as much attention, is that the uh, for Zhuangzi, the uh, forgetting is a way of letting each other be, right? And this is uh, the, the most famous uh, expression of such forgetting, of course, is the one that I just talked about in terms of the the fish forgetting each other, enjoy uh, the sort of the Tao and humans, and we can just forget each other and uh, and enjoy the you know the uh, enjoy the uh, you know the uh, oh the the fish enjoy the the river and the humans just enjoy the the Tao, and the uh, we also we also see the uh, the Zhuangzi's, uh discussion about uh, sort of friendship, so his ideal sort of relationship will be in this kind of the friendly relationship. Um, that, um, that, that's the kind of uh, letting each other be. And so he has a very interesting sort of a 
case uh, story about um, a group of friends who, you know, who said, quote, which one of us can be with where there is no being with, before where there is no being for, which one of us are able to climb the sky and roam the, the, the mist and go whirling into the infinite, living forgetful of each other forever and ever. And they looked at each other, smiled, and so they became friends. So it's apparently the sort of, you know, the, the, the inf even friendly entanglement is problematic for, uh, for Zhuangzi. So rather it's the kind of, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of the forgetting in the social setting basically means to let each other be, you know, as friends, right? And, and what's interesting and important uh, in this context is that um, friendship is the more idealized uh, kind of paradigm relationship in the drones, as opposed to the more of the Confucian, which uh, tends to valorize the family relationship. So Confucians tend to reduce sort of friend relationship between friends to like sibling relationship. But for drones, friends, a friendship, relationship between friends are sui generis. They're not reducible to family relationship because the, uh, the, the family relationship, you know, is by nature hierarchical, at least within in traditional China, with, and whereas a relationship between friends are more equal and they're more horizontal uh, in, in the case of drones, if we do not reduce friend, friendly relationship to family relationship. So the, uh, and this kind of um, letting each other be, right, is a core social, and Zhuangzi's social value. And it's also carried into his discussion about politics. So a sage king, who rules the least and does not impose is the best, right? He just lets everybody be. I mean, it's this is a, we see this in the Laozi as well, and Laozi has you know spelled out more in that as well in the Tao Te Ching. Um, so it's clear that he was, you know, the this kind of political discussion, especially. Uh, discussion about how to serve in political office is not something that Zhuangzi enjoys. You know, he would grudgingly deal with it, but it doesn't really uh, sort of engage in the way that he deal with other dimension. Unlike in the in in the in the Confucian text or in the Moist text, and of course in other like in the the Fajia text, for example. Um, so this is this is where I'm gonna start to draw a conclusion. Now, this really has to do with why the, the Zhuangzi, his vision of personal freedom had so little impact in the, in the political, moral political discourse on personal freedom in Chinese history. Now, because his attitude towards you know, serving in political office is futility and aversion, right? It's, you know, it's largely futile. And if you can avoid it, that will be great. That will be the best. Um, so, Compare with the Confucians who saw serving in political office where the timing is right as one of the most fulfilling and meaningful aspect of a good life. And the Zhuangzi's general attitude towards serving the state is that of futility and aversion, even though he sometimes you know, for, you know, would, would weigh into the tactics of political persuasion or performance. And so this in some ways explain the limited um, contribution of the, of the Zhuangzi to the, to the traditional Chinese moral political discourse. <clears throat> I mean, for those who want to, you know, get away from serving the state, hermits, for example, or those who are frustrated in pursuing their political ambitions, so the, their exile, the scholar officials, um, Zhuangzi is their counsel and their comfort. But then other than that, right, uh, Zhuangzi really didn't, you know, wasn't much of a major voice in the, in the traditional moral political discourse, uh, especially on um, issues like freedom, because that, I mean, that's, that's where it should have made the most uh, kind of impact. So here I'm, you know, um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, um, to, do, uh, to do a more some formal reading on, the, uh, on what's, uh, what I consider to be really problematic um, in this uniquely drongest um, formulation 
an approach to freedom. It clearly has has its um, has its lure, has its um, uh, has its attraction, but it also has its um, severe limitations. So the uh, so these two spaces of personal freedom that schematize right in the Zhuangzi, namely Fang Nei and Fang Wai, indicate that Zhuangzi was very well aware of the challenges of those who want to live a life of personal freedom in the early Chinese context. So the Fang Nei and Fang Wai, sort of the, these two paradigms, the Fang Wai is a kind of a form of a self-marginalization. That's, that's essentially what, what that captures. And the Fang Nei, it's basically kind of an internalization that's exclusively focusing on the, the navigation of the heart mind. And that's a very internalized kind of approach. And the, what's interesting in, in this consideration is that the Zhuangzi radically separates the inner from the outer, right? It's, you know, the, whereas you see in the, in the Confucian text, for example, the inner heart mind and the social political world, there is a, there is a continuum uh, between these different, you know, different dimensions. Whereas in the Zhuangzi's case, that the heart mind is a very a sort of secluded kind of place. And it, it's a place that needs to be cleansed from these impacts and being tainted by these out, outer social political dimensions, especially by these ritual and moral categories. So that's, you know, so the, the kind of heart mind that's cleansed from the, uh, from those um, taint is the one that's the faculty of freedom that would be, that's the conduit of the Tao. And the notion of Tao or heaven in the Zhuangzi's case is the one that's invoked to really transcend the limitation that's um, imposed by this traditional ritual regulated uh, and constituted life world. So the, when, when, the, when Zhuangzi invoke the Tao or heaven in some, in some cases, that's the, a way to try to transcend this kind of limitation that's imposed by, um, by ritual. So, the, so this inner, this radical separation of this inner dimension and the outer dimension, it's also something that's very unique to the drones, whereas, as you said, in the others, um, in especially in the Confucian, there is a there seems to be a continuum between these different kinds of dimensions, which then makes the drones' uh, understanding of freedom also very interesting, attractive, because it's a very sort of spiritually oriented. It's very it's a very personal emphasize on personal cultivation of these um, and 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 try to sort of be attuned to the Tao to this almost mystical elements of the of the cosmos of the world and it's um and it's transcending the the limitation and so it's it's a really wonderful and mysterious and wonder uh, kind of dimension of the personal freedom but then it also means that it you know it does not really participate in the kind of moral political project and especially not really participating in building institution more political in uh, the political institutions in in early China, or pretty much throughout Chinese imperial uh, imperial history, and that's that's really what I consider to be uh, very problematic, um, especially from a more contemporary perspective. And in the book, I I use Isaiah Berlin as a way to sort of to bridge this strongest understanding of personal freedom and to to sort of um, build into a possible bridge into. And into a possibility that uh, a, a sort of reformulated new drunkest idea of uh, of freedom can actually be uh, salvaged, can be understood uh, to actually contribute to a more modern um, political uh, discourse on personal freedom. So, the drunkest considered the you know the 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 uh, the personal and the political really as in incommensurable spaces. That's why he separates the inner from the outer so radically. Um, the and so the the Fang Wai freedom belonging to the personal, and the moral political discourse uh, that's dominated by the Confucians and the uh, and the Moists belong to the political. They're they're incommensurable dimensions for Zhuangzi. So the pursuit of personal freedom for Zhuangzi is essentially a personal effort, whereas the pursuit of these other uh, sort of moral political order. Uh, in the uh, in the book, I characterize that as uh, humanist and partialist humanist and impartialist justice is a political course, and these two kinds of uh, endeavors they're fundamentally at odds with each other for the for Zhuangzi. Now, um, I uh, I'm not going to go into you know too many of the of, of the of the technical details. 
um, the, I, I would just uh, sort of try to bring this to a conclusion in saying that it's uh, <clears throat> the limitation of the strongest imaginaire of freedom in many ways has to do with the fact that it, it almost takes certain things for granted. It takes, for example, the ritual order for granted. So, for example, when and when he was confronted with the uh, you know the the issue of uh, you know how to persuade a tyrant you know in order to change their ways, now not even in the imagined story there will be a case to question the legitimacy of the cage. Right, this is the famous expression of how to navigate inside the king's cage. That's focusing on this personal effort while shining and shining any deliberation about the legitimacy of the cage and treating the king's cage as almost a given. It's almost like, like any other sort of given, it's there. You know, it's the, it's the nature of the world almost. Um, that is, the drums is not exactly challenging or even questioning the cage. His advice on how to deal with what's, you know, how to deal with it is premised on accepting the king's cage as an unalterable and hopeless political reality. He doesn't ponder the possibility of enlarging the proverbial cage or destroying it, not even as a matter of imagination, right? You know, because Stronzi is rich on imagination. So that's really unfortunate. And so it's rather unfortunate and puzzling that he has a rather limited imagination about the possibility of state and the, polit and, and the possibility of politics, especially the place of personal freedom in politics. So the advice that's given in the text is either how to operate within that cage, proverbial cage, right, or how to stay out of it. Um, so so the, the, you know, the, the case, of, so the, the cooked in story is clearly, you know, uh, one such examples. So therefore the vision of this kind of personal freedom, especially the fang nei freedom, leaves out the vast majority of those who are not exactly skillful as the cooked in, right? It's how many of how many of those who are as skillful as cooked in have the butcher, and they're not as skilled in cognitive discernment and social engagement. So, in other words, the Zhuang's vision of fang nei, fang nei personal freedom is at core a personal effort, not a collective or institutional project. Even though Zhuangzi often valorized common folks from the slower strata of traditional society, right? Though he, he you know, what's, what's one of the more distinct aspect of the Zhuangzi that he really appreciate these common folks, these average folks, and sometimes these, some of these social outcasts. But when you look, really look at, when you really examine those are, those um, so-called common folks, they're actually really, exemplars of extraordinary abilities, right? So, um, so that's, that's really, um, so if the ideal of freedom, especially to operate within the society, the Fang Nei kind of freedom is built upon those kind of really extraordinary ability to discern and to navigate um, this kind of intricate um, world based on completely, completely these kind of personal uh, effort, then most people would have no chance in doing that. Um, so that that I that's what I uh, take to be the to be the the the, the, the the one of the tragic and the unfortunate aspect of the Zhuang's vision, because the political implication of leaving the society behind, right? It's in the Fang Wai. It's you know how do you you know how do you um, deal with the these almost hopeless situation? One one. Um, possibility is to just simply uh, to leave the uh, leave the state and you don't have to deal with it. But of course, from especially from a contemporary perspective, the political implication of leaving the society behind is problematic because it's not really useful uh, to engage uh, politics and to really enlarge the realm of freedom. And the uh, that's why Zhuangzi pretty much, and the Zhuangist, his followers, pretty much see the ground uh, of the political discourse for moral political discourse to the, uh, to the Confucians. Now, at the root of this inadequacy of the Zhuangist imagination of political freedom lies in this 
axiomatic privacy, primacy of self-cultivation in the traditional Chinese discourse on personhood, whereas political freedom needs to be conceptualized from the perspective of an ordinary natural person. Okay, so that's where I think is problematic for Johnson, because he always fixates on these extraordinary people with their extraordinary skills. But what about the vast majority of people who really are not um, sort of privy to this kind of uh, to those kind of uh, skill and uh, and discernment? What about them? So there there has to be a place in the in the moral political discourse that would bring this, remember the, the Pao Deans, the, you know, the Cook Deans, this invisible uh, interval, this place, why not bring this out in the open in reimagining the institution of the state, in, in, in imagining a different kind of uh, political order that would accommodate personal freedom in the social political realm, right? Within, within in the middle of, not as a matter of a personal effort, but rather as a collective social political project. And, and so uh, at the end of the book, I critique what I, uh, what I call this, uh, the, the regime of self-cultivation because you know, too much of classical Chinese philosophy just you know, focus on these extraordinary um, persons and the, the sages and you know the, the paragons of virtues or, or in the case of Johnson these uh, really extraordinary people with extraordinary abilities uh, which then leave behind uh, the a lot of other people which is most people I mean other than the fact that they you know they they need to cultivate themselves um, but what about you know sort of their they have their basic sort of rights and their basic uh, sort of uh, freedom that really needs to be uh, sort of conceptualized in other words the for a Zhuangist to have more contribution to the polit moral political discourse in contemporary uh, Chinese situation, uh, or you know, and to contribute more to the uh, um, moral political discourse um, in a contemporary era, that um, theorization needs to take an ordinary natural person's perspe perspective much more seriously than has been within the uh, within the uh, uh, the traditional uh, discourse so I think I will uh, I will just end there thank you very much thank you thank you so much that was really fascinating and um, thought-provoking. Um, I will open this up to questions and, you know, right, yeah, raise your, oh, I already see um, Karsten Struhl has his hand up. Yeah, so. So I have one question and then, and then a comment. Um, the question has to do with understanding how Zhuangzi fits into Taoism in relation to the Lao Tzu. Because in the Lao Tzu, you actually have a sense that the political leader who is in harmony with the Tao leads in a way that he doesn't appear to be a leader, but you know, there's this line that you know, people think they've done it themselves. But nonetheless, simply by being in harmony with the Tao, he is going to lead. Uh, and this move, the Zhuangzi move, is apolitical. In, in a way that radically, politically, in a way that suggests that he has nothing to do with leading the people. So the, for, the question is how you, whether you put, can put those together or whether we should just say these are just very different orientations to politics. The comment is uh, along the line of your, uh, of your last part, where you suggest that maybe there's a way to put this in some kind of institutional building. And there I wonder if there aren't resources in anarchism which can do that, in which there's often within the anarchist framework, there's a certain kind of both individual uh, internalization and collective, collective reaching out to others without the repressive apparatus of the state. 
So any thoughts you have on that? Actually, one more last thought, which is, uh, at least in terms of contemporary social psychology, we think of individuality as arising out of a certain social matrix. And so the Zhuangzi individuality, if that's, tr if that's true, would arise out of a certain social matrix. And then in terms of trying to understand it in its historical context, what's the social matrix out of which Zhuangzi individuality arises? Okay, thank you. Um, so the first question about uh, where does, you know, Zhuangzi and so whether Zhuangzi and Laozi sort of fit together. Um, I mean, in, in a, in some ways, it's unfortunate uh, that the, the the kind of the uh, the uh, the kind of categorization of uh, in in traditional you know sort of uh, uh, literature um, put Laozi and Zhuangzi into into the same right into the kind of you know call them Taoist or now some people call this a proto Taoist or early Taoist. Um, I mean, there there are clearly some themes of resonance between these two texts. But I read the two texts very differently, right? I don't actually see them as belo belonging to the same kind of genre. I mean, the the the, the audience of the uh, of the Laozi seems to be very clear that it was dealing with the monarchs, you know, then dealing with the rulers, and you know, especially trying to you know to to deal with a particular kinds of particular kinds of monarch, and especially those who are let's say weaker, right? You know, who are who needs to survive in this in this kind of a uh, very privileged kind of political uh, environment during the Warren States period. But it's but Trans, I don't really see him engaging in the kinds of you know in the kind of project that Lao Tzu was was engaged in assuming that it's again it's you know, putting aside the, the question of of authorship you know of, you know, of those two kind of those two texts and which is you know very very complicated um the and of course there there are themes of uh, of resonance between there was a reason that those two texts were put together um the uh, uh in historically uh even though there was then a, 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 you know anachronistically sort of Put together in that there has been Taoist, but then um, I just don't I don't see the two texts at least um, in the early in the Warren States period that I just don't see them uh, as addressing uh, the same kind of crowd, the same audience, the same listeners, and then they they seem to be engaged in a very very different kinds of project. They have a very different kind of understanding of personhood, and they have a very different attitude towards uh, towards the state. And, uh, and so and they have a very different, you know, so so much of it is is very, very different. So so I really I so I mean, there, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to dispute the the sort of grouping them together in later texts um, in, in the later tradition as the early Taoist masters, but um, at least within the early the Warren State period, I would I, so in the text, I don't in, in my book, I don't treat them as Taoist, right? I, I treat them separately. One as Laozi, I treat them as the Laoist and the Zhuangist, right? These are the Laozi and the Zhuangzi. They all represent their own, you know, groups of uh, of of uh, of intellectuals, of scholars, and then they're not. These are not singular. These are plurals. So that you know, so that that's that's the the, the question on that. Um, the, the, and the, the second question. Um, Remind me what, what the second question was. I'm, I'm trying to see if there's any way to bring it into some kind of uh, attempt to collect, collectively establish an institutional structure that would instead. Right, that's what I, that's what I hope and, to And I'm do. suggesting that, the, that anarchist, at least some contemporary anarchist resources, try to do something like that. Right, that will be interesting because I'm not familiar with contemporary discourse on anarchism. This this would be really interesting. That would uh, that would probably be something that I should uh, that uh, that I should uh, familiarize myself first before before I say anything stupid. You know? So, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, but, and the third, just uh, oh. the latter, the last one was about what kind of what kind of cultural social context brings forth that form of individuality. I think um, I I would imagine it will be the kind of hermetic, you know, kinds of community, and the, the you know the 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 kind of 
uh, the kind of uh, people that's that that tends to be sort of uh, portrayed in the text and sometimes imagined, right? And the Zhuangzi it turned out to be the to to be one of the largest collections about those uh, sort of hermits in early China. But of course, a lot of contemporary scholars say, well, that's not really an actual depiction of like real person, but it's a lot of them that just imagine sort of fantasized version of that. But it's it's clearly it's it's talking about those who are you know with this kind of disillusionment you know, of what's going on in this uh, during the the Warren States period. It's a very very chaotic and, and violent period. So it's it's addressing those those kind of person not really in not really at the sort of at the you know the at rulers but really at these sort of intellectuals who are completely disillusioned. So then it's that that will be that will be my guess in terms of the kind of the kind of community that you know that that this text emerged out of. Thank you. Uh, Nick? Hey, hi, it's, it's nice to see you. Um, so my, my question is, uh, do you think it makes sense to describe Zhuangzi as a skeptic? And part of the reason I ask that is if you study the history of, of liberalism, that many of the great liberal thinkers were skeptics. So half of, half of their right, or some of their writing would be about epistemology and some of it would be about politics and ethics. And I, I saw on Twitter, you know, you've been engaged in whether whether philosophy is the right term to describe the preaching masters. And so I just I just wanted to ask, do you think do you think skepticism is the right word for Zhuangzi? Um, thank you. So I think there's definitely a, a, a there's definitely a, a skeptic dimension in many strands of its thought, right? You know, I think that's there is deniable, the undeniable. There there is even there is the um, some people in characterize this as relativistic or pluralistic or, or the or the skeptic these all these dimensions I think are very much present in the text and it's you know it's uh, it preaches you know basically it questions the certainty of our knowledge of our claims especially directed against the you know the Confucian and the Moist for example right so it's but then that's really part of the sort of the package about the valorization of freedom because you know the the those the you know the way that he see it those Confucian those Moas uh, all then they were so sure about their project about the validity of the rightness of of their project and then they just do not leave really rooms for other possibilities and and so the so in some ways skepticism it's kind of natural that skepticism you know would it would be an integral part of this you know of this vision of personal freedom. I mean, so that, that's almost a requirement. It's, you know, if the, because in order to leave other possibilities, you, there has to be a sense of humility, the sense of limitation, and then even the limits of the moral discourse, right? That, that in many cases that the moral, the morals can be very injurious. And, and so that, that I think the, the you know, the Zhuangzi brings out um, very, you know, very spectacularly. So, they may, so I, I very much agree with you. So it's, uh, yes, yeah, so, so all of these dimensions, all of these elements are, are really present in the Zhuangzi. I mean, and clearly it's a huge text. So they, they, it has a lot of, you know, it has a lot of strength to it, obviously. Uh, and, and I think skepticism is very much part of the story. Thank you. Uh, Samuel? Oh, hi, thanks. I love that talk. I'm going to get a copy of your book after this. So oh, thank you. My, at least I saw one book. <laughs> yeah, so my question had to do with your critique of Zhuangzi as kind of taking this ritual structure for granted. So you gave a philosophical reason why he does this, namely his too much of a focus on self-cultivation. And I'm wondering about the extent to which you see maybe a social science reason that he doesn't do this, namely that maybe what you need in order to look outside the structure is something like a Chinese Max Weber around at that time, or Fei Xiaotong, you know, some sort of sociologically minded person who could analyze the structure in sufficient detail. And the extent to which you see that maybe Zhuangzi's failure is just a kind of historically contingent failure that there weren't any sociologists around at the time. Or whether you think that even if there were sociologists around at the time, Zhuangzi would still have missed out this uh, element. Yeah. Right. And that's an interesting question. Um... I'm not trying to blame, you know, sort of the lack of uh, the political discourse on, on on personal freedom in, you know, pre-modern, you know, in you know, in, in pre-modern China, squarely just on Zhuangzi, right? He's just part of the. He'd be here. He happens to be one of the most prominent voices. Uh, 
on personal freedom. And, and people tend to focus just on the spiritual dimension, the inner dimension of this. And, and people, um, and, and part of the, the attraction for me um, of let's say Isaiah Berlin, right? Which I dealt with in the conclusion of the, uh, of the book is precisely to critique that kind of approach to, uh, to personal freedom. Uh, to say that it's you know, that that that's it's severely limited, that it's you know that it, it by refusing to engage in the political discourse, to engage the state, that it's that essentially rendering the personal freedom just you know as an individual effort rather than as a collective effort. So in other words, for Zhuangzi, the freedom it's just almost it's um it's the personal freedom is completely dependent on the personal effort. Whereas for, let's say, Azir Berlin, a lot of the liber modern liberal project, freedom is an institution, right? It's, you know, it's, it's not simply, it's, it's a, a set of, of institutional arrangement, which then guarantee certain the, the basic rights uh, within which, within the kind of space, then people enjoy certain prerogative, in, enjoy certain rights without being you know, you know, interfered by others or by the state, most, most importantly. Um, so I, so I, I don't want to say that it's, you know, Zhuangzi is singularly responsible for that. You know, it's, it's hard to say which one is the, the chicken, which one is the egg, right? Because, you know, he was obviously part of the, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the context that he was the product of his time. And then there was, because of the, there was a lack of, you know, of, um, varieties of political institutions of its time, unlike, let's say, in the ancient Greeks, then there are different forms of, uh, of, of the state, then, then, then there can be different kinds of, let's say, constitution, you know, different kind of polity that can be, that can be uh, sort of formulated and conceptualized, whereas, you know, monarchy was just the given, right, that was just, it's, it's just, you know, it's even hard for people in early China to even think, you know, you know any possible alternative. So, so then it's, that's, Part of what I take him to be saying, it's okay, so this is just a given. That's just the, you know, that's just one of those invariable. That's just one of those things that you just cannot escape. And then how do you, given that, how do you deal with it? But, but I, what I do want to fault him somewhat, you know, uh, is to say that as long as we're in this, in the process of imagination and political imagination, you know, and moral political imagination, and, and there, you know, sort of we can at least there's the possibility to imagine other possible alternatives but of course it's easy for us to say because we're exposed to to other possibilities whereas for him that he just you know and so this this really um sort of tell us that our so-called imagination is really not free in the sense that it's you know it's clearly conditioned by the kind of limitation on the ground right by the certain kinds of context that it's even though it was trying to transcend those kind of limitation but it eventually it's you know sort of uh, it's conditioned by those very limitation but you know sort of he does a lot already i mean in the in the case that what i see to be that he's this radical separation of the heart mind from the external world that that's a very special kind of drongest drones's move and it's you know so and then i think that's very valuable in understanding sort of the creating of this inner world that's sacred and that is just of themselves that that you know that that can that and uh, that itself is free or can be free if you know if it, it can be properly uh, nurtured and, and cultivated so for confucius some people say well and sort of at the age of, you know, at the, the age of 70, you know, sort of, you know, Confucius say that, you know, at, you know he, he could do whatever he wants, you know, without overstepping the, this, the, the boundary of what is right, right? And also that's, some people hold that as the, the kind of expression of freedom, spontaneity, right? Well, well Drongzi would think, okay, that's just too tragic, because that means that your heart and mind is completely overtaken by the ritual norms, right? It's, it's completely internalized. Um, by this, by the socialization, by the ritual norm. Whereas for him, for Zhuangzi, that the heart and mind needs to be needs to be able to preserve its uh, its ingenuity and its you know its authenticity uh, and its freedom, and and so 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 that it would not be overwhelmed by this ritual, um, by this really uh, sort of overwhelming uh, ritual uh, structure and rigidity of the life world. And that's that's the way I see it. So the creation of the inner world. 
not that the Confucian didn't have the, the inner world, but it's the inner world that's completely tied to the external, uh, to, the, to the social political world. Zhuangzi is the one that separates the inner world from the, from the outside. And that, that's a really important innovation on the part of Zhuangzi, I think. Thank you. Uh, so, Tinu? Uh, thanks. Did, thanks did, I get that, did I get that right? Yeah, so. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It was a really, really enlightening lecture. And um, I wonder if you could um, explain a little bit more. I'm, I'm sorry if this is a very naive question. I don't really know this area very well. But if you could talk a little bit more about the ontology of uh, the heart mind. Um, I'm curious about uh, whether it implies at least a moderate, a moderate or a weak version of dualism. Um, in that it seems to be, if it's the, the sort of cognitive and affective center of the, the self, and as you say, it, it separates, or at least Zhuangzi separates it very highly from the internal and the external. I'm not sure how, uh, if, if that's the case, how is it still connected to the body? Because it seems to be that way. And if that's true, then how can you really separate it from the external world in which the body operates? That's that's a really great question. And so I think it's, you know, I haven't really thought about it in that way un until you raised it. I think there is there is this co deliberate cultivation of this detachment from the body in the drones, right? You know, so so if you know, so so whatever the ontological status of the hard mind from the body is, then there is at least the deliberate effort to cultivate that it's, you know, so this is very clearly reflected in the way that he you know, look at death, for example. And then it's, you know, so so when he when right now when we think about death, you know, so people's heart people's heart and mind, you know, is really cognitively impaired, right? It's usually you you cannot really be so clear minded and, and so forth. But then for drones, when he portrayed these sort of death cases, these near death cases, those people who were their body is really going bad, right? And then they could still in, engage in this really sophisticated kind of conversation with their friends. And then, you know, then these friends would just absolutely just, you know, they would be riveted in this kind of conversation with a person who's like dying, you know, in front of them. And when their family member were just wailing, you know, you know, and then, you know, their friends would just like, you know, get out of here, just do not get into the way of the transformation that's really undergoing. So, so I think it's, there's, there's definitely a case of the, the kind of the, the heart of mind that's detached from the sort of the externality, even including the body in this in this case. I mean, at least in and this on those kind of occasions. I mean, it's there, there are other kind of contact, there's other kinds of occasions when you see the sort of the the, the body and body mind is, you know, is is a more sort of integral and more sort of in, integrated, you know, that, but at least on those kinds of occasions and the, in those portray of those situations, um when when the when Jones takes such a radically different attitude towards the sort of the death of the body, and and this sort of to to then separate that and say, well, you know, sort of it's that the mind is you know is something that is really can be disentangled from all of those um, vicissitudes and all of those uh, just inevitable changes that's happening uh, around, and and so that can sort of separate the uh, the heart and mind in that kind of purify, that kind of cleanse, that kind of Tao dwelled kind of uh, mystical almost dimension. Just one quick question: Would that be seen by him as a kind of return to an original state of the heart mind, or is it a kind of uh, rising up above an original? entangled state to an unentangled state? I think it will be returning to the original kind of, um, because that, you know, that really is the more primordial state. And then in, in, in the course of a socialization, um, then we gradually lose that original sort of endowment of the heart and mind. So then it's, and then we, we're being populated by these different kinds of categories, you know, and, and then that drives out this original endowment of this authenticity and, and of the freedom and the, of gen, ingenuity. So, um, and then it's, it's so, so to return to, to that original state will be the, will be what drones uphold as the idea. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doug, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I did. Go thank ahead. you. Um, great, yeah, this was a really fascinating talk. I enjoyed it. Um, 
I, I want to sort of follow up on the last question as well as uh, something you were saying about uh, uh, it's really in line with your critique of the Dranza that he's he just doesn't envision a space uh, for uh, uh, people to just just kind of everyday people to collectively uh, uh, form various kinds of groups or institutions where they can sort of have a dimension of of, uh, of, of political freedom right and social freedom. Um, and uh, what, what occurred to me when you were talking about that, and, and also in your response to the last question, uh, there, you mentioned the dying, for instance, in your, in your last response. Right. And uh, another group of people that seems to be frequently idealized in various places in the drones are, are, are disabled people, like yeah. really severely disabled people, disfigured people. And, and there have been some modern readings, and, I, and I'm also sort of a at least up to now, I, I've been inclined to to find those those readings uh, appealing. That uh, you know, sort of uh, the Dranza is really putting front and center people who are who are, who are normally marginalized, right? But then, if if I'm understanding your critique correctly, uh, this 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 idealization of of severely disabled or disfigured people, uh, because they're all represented as sages too, is is just another way of sort of idealizing this uh, this extraordinary person. And sort of missing the missing the middle, the average, the everyday uh, of society. Do, do, do you think that that's kind of implied in your critique as well? Uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because you know, sort of because it, it appeared that you know. Thank you for bringing that up, right? So again, he's he's one of those texts that just celebrate these dis disfigured and severely, you know, sort of you know, sort of uh, handicapped, you know, and you know, sort of uh, disabled, you know, bodies, right? You know, that that it's really extraordinary, and it's it's not it's you know that you don't find other texts like that, right? You know, in you know in, in at least in early China. So so then it's you know so that he idealized those, and then many of them are sort of, are are the sort of embodiment of these kind of virtues and these paragons of these skills and discernments, you know, and uh, and then it's, you know, it's something they also couldn't care less about what's going on outside, because of course, you know, sort of the, the outside world is the one that would look down upon them, that they would be the sort of the social outcasts, right, that they, so then, you know, for them, their only recourse is to resort to this inner dimension, this 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 hard mind that is really radically separated from from this outside, including the body that's disfigured, that's disfigured and that's uh, that's uh, disabled, and and so that that's their only salvation is to and then they they end up being their potency right end up being attracting a lot of other people even though their their bodily form might be you know not the most attractive form but then they end up they're they're very magnetic and charismatic and they ended up attracting a lot of other people you know to you know to to follow around them you know. Right, and then that—that's really what's interesting. So, so yes, indeed, and that's so. Sometimes, sometimes we might think, okay, so so then this this seems to be that he was celebrating the social outcasts. Yes, yes, in one sense, but no, in another sense, because they are yes, they're social outcasts in in that in that sense, in the social sense. But then, in terms of their individual ability, they're absolutely no average Joe, right? You know, so they're extraordinary persons. That they're and they you know they have extraordinary sense of ability uh, and discernibility and uh, and the, and potency and that really separate them out from from everybody else um whether you know sort of bodily disabled or not um and and so so that's so that's why i say okay to conceptualize freedom in that way is still very much limiting yes there is the subversive aspect i think that's very that's very clear yeah. in the text but then there's also a sort of saying that it's these are still individual efforts Right. Yeah. These are still individual effort through their own effort that they were able to overcome their bodily uh, sort of handicap and to disfigurement and in order to reach this higher this higher state. Um, but but then so there's still lack of talking about a certain shared kind of uh, sort of space, public space of personal freedom within which that it will be available to 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 average person on the street, the, the sort of the natural person right who have natural have average cognitive you know sort of abilities and and so forth and that's really the the sort of at the heart of the liberal project obviously so so that's that's also why i critique this what i call the regime of self cultivation because it's you know it's the self cultivation is almost left to do too much heavy theoretical heavy lifting in classical chinese thought it's whatever problem it's like okay just throw that to 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 self cultivation the the cultivated person can can deal with this right you know so then they don't have to spell out all of these all of these different you know different kinds of problems and i mean that's you know sort of the the, the, the most would you know would, would critique the, the confucian in those in those kind of fashions but um but but i think it's you know the what's 
ironic is that it's actually the, the so-called legalists, the Fa Jia thinkers, who were actually taking um, the people's uh, sort of the average person's experience and perspective much more seriously and try to build the political institution in that way. Rather than trying to sort of complain about, you know, oh, we're just too selfish and we're just too self-centered and uh, blah, blah, blah. We're just too much greedy and uh, we're too into, into that. You know, the Fajian said, well, you know, why can't we build a system that would actually capitalize, yeah. you know, sort of the, the, the kind of natural disposition of an of a ordinary person. And uh, so, I think there, so I think I think that sort of if we can harness that kind of, a, you know, sort of political uh, institution building, right, to, to actually take more seriously the uh, the you know, the the average person's perspective and but then you know direct it towards more uh, the the uh, you know the, the the personal you know freedom uh, so forth that would be mu much much more fruitful than simply to say okay people are not cultivated i mean that's just because people are never going to be cultivated i mean that's just the hopeless premise yeah, yeah. So, yeah, these these just a quick follow up. So these uh, these disabled and disfigured people that are idealized in the tech. Yeah, I mean they 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 they, they attract other people. They attract animals in the forest. Uh, oh gosh, yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, There's but, something about them that just attract others. Yes. But but also they're 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 kind of these liminal figures because uh, the, the the implicit uh, the the implicit. Uh, um, sort of uh, fact that's there is that probably in many cases, you know, sort of disabled and disfigured people were disabled and disfigured as a result of, of, of criminal punishment, right? So they've already been, they've already been ostracized from the society. And so they're, they're sages because the self-cultivation is the only option left to them. There's exactly. no way back. Exactly, exactly. Right back to the self-cultivation. So again, that, you know, falls into the same trope, right? It's, you know, so, so yes, it's good for, for, for these folks, you know, but, yeah. but again, as a collective you know, project, it's just not adequate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Thank, 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 you, thank you, thank you for that comment, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, we are at right at the end of our scheduled time, but I'd like to ask you if you are willing to keep discussing for anybody who wants to continue to hang out, or are you? Sure, um, I can, I can, I can hang out a, a, a little. Yes, uh, sure. I mean, there, I saw there, there's some question um, in the chat room. Um, so one was asking, um, is this Zhuangzi's definition of personal freedom different from Lao Tzu's, or Lao Tzu really have no view on this? Yeah, I don't. I don't really think Lao Tzu has a view on, on this. And so the personal freedom. My point is that the person, the notion of personal freedom, is really unique to Zhuangzi, right? So I, you know, I don't think you can find that in in really any other text, and it requires the kind of you know the kind of apparatus, you know, the kind of imagination that you don't really find in other. In other early texts, at least. So yes, I, I I think that's that that will be that'll be my answer to that. So um, and actually, I would have a follow up question on oh, that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah. Um, but it, I'm also going through the chat to see if. Um, oh, I see. Oh, I see. Um, well, okay, yeah, so there's an interesting question about normative Fang Wai. Um, but I just, your discussion, the comparison of the Tao Te Ching um, brings up an, a point that I was thinking about while you were talking about this inner world is sacred and um, making this quest for personal freedom into a kind of collective endeavor in the modern world in in a modern context and what i'm recalling from your chapter on the Tao Te Ching is a really cogent um inter, uh, reading of it wherein the Tao Te Ching is basically basically saying to the confucian how dare you co-opt uh family feeling uh, to as a means of socializing a person to serve the state, you know how dare you take that that inner that inner world that um, person very personal inner space to serve the state. Now to sort of play devil's advocate here, wouldn't your prescription about the sacredness of 
inner inner space um, and turning that into um, um, a means of collective cultivate cultivation although that isn't exactly what you were arguing um, wouldn't wouldn't that be subject to the same kind of critique um, that this and also the question is in effect is are we already co-opting the inner world in cultivation of all of these different bubbles these base these sort of internet worlds bubbles that that people engage in without in some cases without really distinguishing political and personal but the bubble becomes both but both family politics and personal inner space um so yeah can you speak to that hey, no, dilemma i see it as a, dile no, as a that, fruitful dilemma no that is that is an absolutely fascinating question it's you know again it's you know this is why this is why this these kind of occasion was just so fascinating it's like you know i don't usually hear questions like like this so uh, so thank you for reading my book very carefully. So yes, in in the in the Laozi chapter, right, the Tao Te Ching chapter, so that I that I did you know argue at least you know this is not my position. It's the, this is the, the the what I represent to be the Laozi's position that he was critiquing the the Confucians for appropriating or misappropriating the sort of the the familial sentiment and as the resource. For the political content, for the political kind of project. So, so yes, there is the the familial sort of um, filial, the piety, the love between you know kins, between brothers and sisters, siblings, and you know and and between parents and, and children. So of course, those are all those are all good. Uh, he actually Lao Tzu didn't reject that. I mean, he very much embraced them. But it's but the, for Lao Tzu, the, the, the problem go you know the, the problem arises when you try to harness that and to make that. To universalize that into this, you know, as the the kind of the 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 conceptual or emotional, re or, or 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 moral uh, sort of resource for these larger kinds of project. That's where that's where the the Confucians went wrong, right? I mean, that, that's what I take to be the to be the kind of meta ethical, you know, critique that uh, that is uh, leveled against the Confucians by the Laos. So 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 then so I take what you're you're asking is. So are you, am I, what I'm proposing, am I forcing Zhuangzi into the sort of the same kind of trap, right? To, to sort of universalize this sort of personal freedom, this inner, this, this inner dimension. And then, and then that would just then subjugate to its own, you know, corruption. And, and so Lao Tzu would have a word, you know, with that, with, you know, it would have a field day on that and say, well, that's, um, that is very, uh, that is very deeply problematic and that might even be vastly deluded. Am I understanding the question right, right? So, so that's, yeah. that's, that's really, really fascinating. Um, so we're really in the, into the realm of, of speculation because obviously Lao Tzu didn't, you know, Tzu didn't address Zhuang Tzu, right? If I put, you know, Lao Tzu ahead of Zhuang Tzu. So, so Zhuangzi would appropriate, you know, Lao Tzu sort of framework of terminology and, and, and so forth, but, you know, Lao Tzu didn't really deal with the, the Zhuangzi framework so much. Uh, and, and so I think there is definitely a possibility, there is definitely a possibility that the project of, of personal freedom can absolutely be corrupted, right? And we see this even in the, you know, in the, in the contemporary liberal project, you know, right? That, that it's very, very easy to be hijacked by by these different kinds of considerations that it's you know that it you know that if it's not properly sort of vetted if it's not properly guarded against and and then these other kinds of you know other you know other kinds of dimensions other other uh, elements and there will be unintended consequences yes they you know that that I think Lao Tzu will be it will be it will be right you know, to, to critique that and to say that it's, that be careful, you guys, you know, because, you know, you know, before you know it, you might even lose the inner dimension that is so great about the, the allure of the Drones' project, of the Drones' inner, the spiritual freedom, right? So I think, I think that's valid. How, on the other hand, um, I think it's, there is at least the possibility, I, I want to maintain the possibility that how you know so how does Zhuangzi argue against 
you know, that kind of opposition, that kind of move by Laozi, that's which is a very powerful move uh, from, uh, from the Laozi, uh, sort of via Wendy. Uh, so um, I probably have to think about this because, because, the, because the, 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 there's always the danger. There's always the danger of, of being co-opted and being corrupted um, when we're dealing with these kind of universalist kind of projects. And Laozi is critical of all universalist projects because he thinks that you know, the humans are just not universal animals. And so we're just, you know, we're very local. That's why he advocates these sort of smaller kind of community, right? You know, that's the only way that we get to maintain our endowment, not to overstretch our natural endowment as humans. So maybe, maybe Zhuangzi, you know, maybe Laozi would be okay if we, you know, sort of limit the, the kind of dimension of freedom to a smaller community, right? And maybe that, that's one way to, to, to sort of, to, to think about, you know, sort of in that kind of dimension, because once you get into the more, the, the much larger kind of polity, uh, then I think that that's a real danger, and I'm not, you know, and I'm not sure there's actually a good safeguard against it because you know, as as we're still going through this very very traumatic period, I think that you know I, I need to actually think about that. That's that's a very very important challenge. Thank you. That's that's a, that's a very very interesting challenge. Um, Carson, you want to have a last question? Well, sure. I, well, I don't know if it's the last word, but I just want to really congratulate you on the publication of the book. I, I look forward to reading it. And Thank this you. has been a if, if this is what comes out of the book, this has been a fascinating discussion. So I would say, and then, and then I do have a couple of very brief comments. One is I've I've been tossing in my mind what kind of, you know, if you go beyond uh, Schwangza and just say, but what kind of institutional structures might be built that would in some sense um, utilize some of the 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 ethos of this. Um, you could think of institutional structures which allowed for lots of space for self-cultivation, for development of friendship and so forth. And interestingly enough, there are actually interesting proposals along the line, even in very contemporary American politics. So for example, basic income guarantee. <laughs> no, you don't have to work <laughs> if you don't want to might be give people the freedom to self-cultivate. Um, and the last thought is there are some echoes of the Shuangzi uh, in people like Thoreau, for example. If you go to Walden, you really see some of that same sentiment uh, in, in uh, Thoreau's Walden. And I can't think of others at the moment, but it seems to me that there's some other interesting echoes. So I just wanted to add that to the discussion. Thank you. That, yeah, that's. I think Thoreau will be will be a very interesting sort of contemporary, almost Johnson in in some ways, yeah, an American version of it. Yes. Uh, 